morning shine, shine, shine. Las Vegas, shine your light on me. Welcome to Las Vegas Tonight with your award-winning host, Dale Davidson. Dale interviews fascinating guests from top-ranked celebrities to people just like you who have an important story to tell. For more than 15 years, Dale is broadcast every week from the fabulous Las Vegas Strip. He finds the people who really make Las Vegas a one-of-a-kind city and lets the world know just what's happening in this remarkable town. You'll discover why 50 million people visit the entertainment capital of the world every year. Stay tuned for another exciting episode of Las Vegas Tonight. Welcome to Las Vegas Tonight. I'm your host, Dale Davidson, and I'm blessed to be your host. Thank you for tuning in. You're going to be really glad you did. Jackson Crisp is with us. He's a fantastic guest, great backstory, and a very accomplished gentleman. Jackson, thanks for being on the show. Hey, good to meet you. Yeah, well, we really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, people would never guess you once played in the NFL by looking at you. <laughs> what uh, else would you have done? Right, I always say figure skating. <laughs> 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 they say. That's yeah, great. Yeah. So you, were you a big kid in Cheyenne, Wyoming, where you were growing up? Yeah, so right? yeah, a lot of folks, just um, they don't, when I say Cheyenne, Wyoming, they're like, what is Wyoming, and yes. then what is Cheyenne, right? Yeah, no, I was always a bigger than average kid. Yeah. So yeah. I think I was this tall in the uh, ninth grade. Oh my lord! And yeah, a few pounds less, but this tall. <laughs> yeah, all of us were yeah. a few pounds yeah. less. And will were, were you recruit recruited in high school to be a football player? Well, yeah, that whole story. Um, it's it's a pretty unique story. So I was a three sport guy. Uh huh. Um, I did track, basketball, and football. Okay. And then I gave it a shot in wrestling my ninth grade year where there was actually an injury that would come back to haunt me later oh, right. on, a, on my shot in the oh, NFL. Oh, hurt, yeah. Um, but uh, I was recruited out of high school, but I was recruited to, um, when I was, w my goal was not to play football. Yeah. Right, I, I like football and I loved it. But my goal was to use it to get a better education. Oh, smart. Right. That and smart, um, yeah. and the Colorado School of Mines was a top engineering school. That's a great school. Yeah. yeah. I went to DU in Denver. Okay, so you so know. So I know, you know. I know Golden really well. Yeah. A great school, and there's a, there's a little beer company in that town, as I recall. <laughs> yeah. We would do the we would do the tour all the time oh, <laughs> for yeah. every weekend. Yeah. Coors beer. The, the Coors oh, beer. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so I knew that that school was there, and the, the coach really wanted me to play. Um, there were some challenges, though, because I, although I had a good GPA in high school, um, the standardized tests I didn't do very well on. And okay. the School of Mines, you know, they compete with Harvard regularly right, in engineering, do. and they beat them a few years in terms of ranking. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so their academic standards were just through the roof. Mm. and. The coach really wanted me to play, and the, the, the thing was, is I, back then, uh, the ADHD, everyone has it now, but back then it wasn't diagnosed, and there were right. really no ways to sort of help kids learn through it, so I was sort of self-teaching myself to do that. Right, right. And those standardized tests are very reading comprehensive, right? So even the math and the science, you had to be able to read. Word problems. Word problems. Long yeah, word problems. On a timer, right? Yeah, right, yeah. And so that was really hindering me. So it didn't really represent my intelligence or EQ yeah. um, in terms of where it was at. And uh, But nonetheless, I didn't hit the standards for mines. So the academic professor or the academics at mines um, actually didn't want me to attend the school because they didn't want to start a precedence of yeah. letting athletes in yeah and so marv k uh, a close my coach and at the time and a great mentor of mine mm -hmm. really pulled for me and uh he got me the opportunity to go there on a full athletic scholarship but i was under academic probation right from go. right from the go wow wow <laughs> right so you had to reach a certain point and all that sort of thing yeah. which made it even harder i'll bet well yeah I actually respond, so that's one of the things that I've always done. I respond to adversity. Like someone says you can't do it, right. I'm like, don't ever tell me can't or never, right? That's just sort of ingrained in me, and that's why I come up with great ideas and all that, because where a lot of people throw their hands up, I'm like, no, you know, you, just yeah. get, you can work it out. Yeah, sure. But I got there, and 
I ended up uh, getting a real high GPA. I think it was around a 3.8 that first year. Wow. And, and they went, we were wrong. And they went, we were wrong. And not only that, I earned a full academic scholarship. Wow. And I was able to give. Uh, yeah, it was pretty awesome because I wasn't expected to make it. And then I was able to give my athletic scholarship to another player. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, so it was that's sort of fantastic. a. fantastic. Yeah. And how did you like Golden? It's a beautiful town. You know, I, I uh, love Golden. I love the coach. You know, uh, Coach Marv K was our head coach then. Yeah. And now they have the stadium named at the new oh. stadium. Stadium there. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Wow. So back when I played, it wasn't a football powerhouse, and but now, believe it or not, it's uh, they rank top three in the nation, is NCAA. That right? Yeah, and they is made it to the semifinals. Right? Wow. So they've turned that football program. I mean, it's amazing, and they have a new stadium there with uh, sky boxes, and it's called Marv K Stadium. Oh, so. that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it's that's pretty beautiful. cool. Now, engineering is a tough major anyway. Yeah. What attracted you to that? Were you uh, a science and math kind of kind of guy in high school, for example? Yeah, I was one of those guys that would always ask, how does it work, right? Yeah, and keep yeah. asking those questions and drive the parents and step-parents crazy. <laughs> because they're like, oh, give it a break. How do stars Take this do thing this? apart and put it yeah, back together. And I would again. always tinker around. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I think I was just sort of naturally curious. And it's funny because later on in life, I discovered I didn't really want to be an engineer, uh -huh. a bit more of a project manager okay. with a technical background, right? right? I wanted to see the whole picture and put yeah. together the whole oh, okay. project and puzzle. To but supervise it all. Supervise it all yeah. and make it work. And uh, but engineering is still important in that because you need to know process oh, sure. and, and how things work and how things are put together. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's sort of the direction I went. But yeah, I thought for sure I wanted to, I think when I was uh, five, I said, uh, Mom, I want to be an engineer and a football player, right? And you, uh, and you did both. And I did both. So, you yeah, did both. That, that law of attraction thing. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, who did you play? You played for the Jets briefly? Yeah. So that was, um, I. again, I wasn't trying to play football uh, in yeah. the NFL. I was wanting to pay for my school. And right. now my school was paid for academically. And so I'm still playing football because I enjoyed it yeah. and my teammates. And um, I st I'd excelled at it, you and I well. I went to the All Star the Division Two All Star games um, my junior and senior year I believe, and the junior year when I was there I did very well right. in that game, and then uh, I started getting invited to go practice at CU. Um, all right. So drive over to see you and train with the guys in Boulder. In Boulder, yeah. a, a lot of the older guys that we might know, like Cordell and Westbrook and all oh, that, that sure. played with the Steelers. Oh yeah. And Doc Crease was there, and so I'd, I'd go over there because we didn't have a we didn't have a strength coach and training program. You know, no yeah. favors. Uh, there was <laughs> none of the stuff that big schools get, right? Uh, yeah. Nutritionists, strength coaches, and so when that interest picked up, I started going over there. And uh, training with them, getting close with the guys. Yeah. And I got invited to a regional combine, right? And so after the All Star game, I got on the scouts' radar because of how I performed. And then I was invited to that combine. And so oh, I yeah. started working out with CU to sort of get um, uh, ready for the combine because there's not. I think I was the second or third guy ever out of mines to get a pro shot at that time. Right. Right. And so there That's weren't <laughs> there weren't any of that going on at mine. So yeah. I was doing that there, and um, I went to the combine and I tested super high on the like uh, I think the top one or two or, or not not one but top five in the okay. nation in terms of strength, speed, and size and vertical wow. jump, wow. and all that. So that's what gave me the real shot. And then when I tested real well at that combine. That's when all the buzz started happening and the articles and this, this kid from the School of Mines is going to get the shot to, yeah, for the yeah. NFL draft. And so it was a real exciting time for the, the school, right? And yeah. me. They um, were not really happy. They were really happy. You, Big time. On the, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah. And, and they, were, they were brilliant all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we recruited this guy. Yeah. No, I, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun and, and you asked how I got there. Yeah, so um, that was a long process. And, and then, uh, so through the draft, I, I had got an agent. All this stuff I hadn't been even uh, thought about, even right? thought about yeah. is all of a sudden being tossed at me and scouts coming to the games now. And 
like everyone you know to watch practices and the games yeah. and all that yeah. so there was a lot of activity around that and uh the draft day came and i was a projected uh third or fourth round pick right that year and which is amazing, going from obscurity to now competing with Division One, and, and oh, you know yeah, because yeah. of the, the combine I did. There's hardly any Division Two guys it, ever made. Yeah, it. And especially on the on the board, the right? Draft, so it was yeah. a. Um, I was doing, you know, I was working out with the, uh, some of the Broncos at the time to sort of get used to the next level. Right. And um, anyway, so draft day came, and I'm at school at my fraternity house. It was a football fraternity. And, uh, you know, I think Marlon talked about this too, but draft day for draft day is a weird day for everybody I'll because bet. nothing goes how you think, and, yeah. unless you're just, you know, there's certain people, but they're very rare. The draft day started, and uh, they're going down, and no tackles are going. And, and, and really? th- this is the one year, I can't remember another year where just no offensive linemen were going. Really? Yeah. Because typically they go. They're frequent because of their being, you know, they get it's a position where you get hurt a lot. Yeah. And uh, no one was going. It was just a really odd year. And so yeah. I talk about these little misses. Yeah. Like if I would have redshirted, you know, and came out the following year, the it following year different. they all went. Yeah. Right. But that year is just a, a little miss. And uh, so the third round came, the fourth round came, and nothing. Right. Mm-hmm. And then the linemen started getting picked up. Fifth round came, the Steelers coach called me because I had been practicing with CU and yeah. knew the players there. Yes. So the offensive line coach called me and said, uh, we're going to pick you up in the sixth or seventh round, son. And I was like, yes, sir, coach. I'm ready to come play for you guys. And uh, just like in the movies, the sixth and the seventh round came. They Not went that. with someone else on the board. Oh, no. Right. So that was my draft day. So it went from this hype to crickets. Yeah. <laughs> and my agent called me right up and said, just hang tight. Uh, I'll give you a call back. And the next morning he called me and said, the Jets want to pick you up on a free agent contract. And it was little money, but it wasn't the big money. You know, yeah. just everything changes. When you get drafted higher, there's yeah. an investment in you. Yes. And so you're almost guaranteed a, a, a few years and a few years of development. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Where you're as lower into the free agent spot, you're, you're not as business invested because yeah. it's a business. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so I went in the, as a free agent to the to the Jets, and that's sort of my in from yeah. Mines to the Jets. It was a whirlwind, yeah, and uh, happened quick. <laughs> yeah. Wow, wow! Yeah. And and you suffered a, a career-ending injury, right? Yeah. yeah. So that little miss thing just kept happening with yeah. that whole shot. Um, I got there, uh, came up to speed because I, I mean, imagine coming from D two to. Oh, to this yeah. level with size and yeah. strength and speed and yeah. and um you know just And you were clearly smart so you were learning the playbook. I was learning the you know the playbooks like this with against the best in the world and and you're taking all the reps because yeah uh you're the you're the young guy coming in so you're going against the first string taking all the reps and uh it was, it was a great time and I was very aggressive between the plays but it wears down on you you know oh, sure, with, sure. Uh, going through camp like that but um so two or three weeks in there's a spring camp and you got to get qualified for the fall camp right you got to get make it you got to get make it through to the fall camp yeah, where they cut down to the final roster right and so spring camp i um got there and i started getting used to the guys and the right. speed and what's involved and it's yeah. crazy you know this in business and as an interviewer in your professional career right yeah when you start playing at those next levels it's, it's different. like it's different it's and different. how did i ever play at that previous level yes right yeah. you don't ever go you don't ever go back yes and so that confidence started just stepping up so i went oh my god i can i can do i this. could do this yeah yeah and make a and make a career out of it i was getting excited making the friends the coaches love me i'm um, doing all this and um so I, uh, there's a story. There's a there's a sort of a gross story, but a funny story. <laughs> Not too gross for the camera. But, um, spring camp, I'm going through, and we're in shells. That means just shoulder pads and helmet. Right. But it's still full. I mean, it's pretty much full go. You know, yeah. everyone's competing You're for each other. million dollar jobs. So everything's there's not really walk through at that level. Yeah. And um, there was maybe a week or two weeks left of camp, and I got my hand up in 
the tackle is the Marvin Washington, the defensive tackle. Yeah. And they don't like that when you get your hand in their face mask. Yeah. And he broke my hand. Oh, he went like that. He broke just it. It was on purpose. It was. I'm not going to say that, but let's right. just say it was an aggressive move, and it broke this metacarpal. And I knew it was a clean break. I heard it snap and all that. Oh yeah. And so I got back home, and I have the ice on it, and this finger's rotating in. Oh, right. Yeah. So it's a it's, it's a clean it's, it's a clean break. Yeah. So I won't get into the details, but I would reset it every night, and go to sleep, and then re-break it the next day. Oh, because dear I didn't want to report it. You didn't want to tell. Didn't anybody. want to report it, and then uh, uh, I got through camp and I made it to the fall camp. So yeah. that was a good part. The other good part is when I got home, the doctor said you're crazy for doing that, but. It worked out all that rebreak and did a good calcium thing, and it's probably stronger than it was naturally. So, really? Wow. Yeah. That's <laughs> so, incredible. So That's I talk incredible. about, yeah, sometimes so. the pain makes you stronger. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> like life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Jackson, we need to take a brief break. Okay. Uh, we're going to come back, talk a little bit about Wyoming and what growing up there was like. All right. And then, uh, and then more about your career, which is really impressive. All right. Thanks. Jackson Crisp is our very special guest. We'll be back with him right after this. Hi, I'm Dale Davidson, host of Las Vegas Tonight. You know, radio has an enduring place in the heart of America. Sometimes it's music that can enliven your spirit or keep you company when you need some. More often for me, it's just been the right spoken word or two that can quiet my mind and soul. Radio brings me a reassuring word in the quiet of night or a welcoming voice early in the morning as I shake off the night's sleep and find my way into God's purpose for my day. And always, I find the best radio station is the one that brings me the best news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. My favorite radio station is KKVV in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's still right where it's been for years at 1060 on the AM dial, hovering over Sin City like a gospel airship, broadcasting the good news of the abounding love that Jesus Christ has for every single one of us. No matter who you are or where you live, you can receive God's word via the KKVV gospel airship. Just go to kkvv.com and click on listen live. KKVV is using all the tools that God's provided them, like podcasting and video streaming and video on demand to produce programs that lift up our fellow believers and save the lost. If you feel a calling to speak to others about Jesus Christ on your very own show, pick up the phone and call the station. They'll be happy to tell you how. Call KKVV today at 702-731-731. 5588 or drop them an email at kkvvradio at hotmail.com. Please join me in becoming part of the KKVV family. You'll be glad you did. Welcome back to Las Vegas Tonight. I'm your host, Dale Davidson. My guest, Jackson Crisp, gave us a fantastic first segment. And if you're watching this on social media, rewind, watch it again, because it was fantastic. <laughs> and he's going to do the same thing in two. Live up to that. <laughs> he makes it easy. <laughs> thanks, okay. thanks. Yep. We were talking about motivational speaking. I want to pick up on that for just a second. I know you do some. Mm -hmm. uh, you say not as much uh, lately because you're an inventor and you're working on inventions. But yeah. it's a different life, isn't it? It's a, it's a, it's a little bit like professional sports in the sense that uh, the adrenaline rush hits you the minute you get there, yeah. and then you try to do your best to yeah. live up to what the crowd expects. Yeah. But it's really a great thing, isn't it? Yeah. Don't you no, love that's, speaking? That's why I got into it. Yeah. Right. And I've always been a speaker my whole life. Have you? Yeah. I, yeah. Even the few events I went to before I got into the industry, <clears throat> people were always saying, you should be on, st why aren't you on stage? And I was like, because I like to teach yeah. and I like to inspire just so naturally. I, yeah. Right. And so I was just like, yeah, you know, I, and I love it. And, you know, the football thing, we can maybe talk about that later. Didn't It didn't end very well. Before the traction got started, it, got, it was over. But that adrenaline you get, 
um, through football, yeah, uh, and, and just everything involved with it. it. Yeah, you don't ever, yeah, you don't ever forget it. Yeah, right. Yeah, that excitement. It's uh, that excitement, that adrenaline, yeah. just that rush, um, yeah. that natural high. And um, the only thing that's got me close to that is when I get done on a stage speaking to people, public speaking. Or, That'll uh, do it, you know. And and I'm yeah. just like, you know, that could be the that could be the, and I can always change my topic. Yes. Right. I could change the people I talk to. Yeah. I can, you know, I can sort of control that a little bit. And I went, yeah, this is what I want to do for the rest. I don't have to beat my body up. <laughs> right. That's and right. I can still yeah. get some yeah. of that adrenaline. So, yeah, it just uh, it, it was a natural fit in terms yeah. of inspirational, motivational. And I not even do SME, subject matter expert types oh, of talks okay. Okay. related to engineering and project management and systems. Oh, that's Stuff fantastic. Like that. yeah. uh, let's let's go back to your childhood for just a second. What was it like growing up in Wyoming? It's a sparsely populated state. Uh, it's a beautiful state. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, I almost went to Cheyenne to work when I was with the Associated Press. And my guest tomorrow, Shalene, uh, uh, back to Marion, is from Cheyenne, and they own a TV station there. So that, that's it's a small, small world. world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, big time. So anyway, uh, what yeah. was it like? Well, I always like to say, because people don't really, it, Cheyenne's one of the bigger states, and we have the population of Vegas. Yeah. Right, in the whole state. The whole state. The whole state. Yeah. Yeah, so it's pretty It's pretty incredible, a lot of land, um, and there's lots of beauty in it. You know, people oh, think, people just think, westerns and flat yeah. some tumbleweeds and all that there's that too but uh, there's beautiful beautiful mountains, beautiful mountains. Yeah. and yeah. and uh, and just a the lot Grand of land the Grand Tetons and, yeah. and Jackson, Jackson Hole, Hole and, and Yellow Snow Park and oh it's magnificent the Black there. Hills yeah, yeah. and so. were you an outdoors kid um you know I I was in Cheyenne so it was the there's a that's huge a mecca city. in the city of yeah. Wyoming yeah. which wasn't big but yeah no I, that's one thing I tell I just couldn't imagine nowadays with these video games and yeah. and these these phones and all that, uh, you know, I was always whenever I had my free time, I was always out in the weeds, messing Outside. around or doing stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and I just uh, I think it's so important to disconnect sometimes, isn't it though? Yeah, and yeah. I think we forget that sometimes. Yeah, uh, screen time. Design. <laughs> yeah, screen time is. Uh, yeah. You know, and you talk about ADHD, which you suffered from. I've got a son who's got it, mm -hmm. and uh, and that is difficult. Mm -hmm. But you know, you combine that with uh, with screen time, and it's a bad, bad thing. Oh, and you know? likes and the addiction. You know, there's some shows out on that. Yeah, that's all engineered. You know, yeah. so I always say guard your. Well, Les Brown says it too, but uh, and I like the quote: "Is guard your ears to your mind." Right, and right. that basically you're just distractions because there's always someone trying to put stuff in it yeah. that doesn't need to be in it. So, I always talk about you know learn your boundaries and and learn uh, right because we all get hooked. You know we all get that sort of addiction and that rush from the likes and the da da da. Yeah, but you know you know my my younger my younger days there was some stuff. You know I'm a biracial background with a black and white parent, right. and. Um, Wyoming, everyone says, well, did you have a lot of problems in Wyoming, right? And I, it was, it was uh, inadvertent. The stuff that was happening wasn't malicious. You know, as I got perspective on it, yeah. looking back on my life. Yes. Um, and the values overshadowed that. Just sort of how people were just genuinely good. Yeah. Um, They're good people. Good there. people. Yeah. yeah. And the... The, the school was a little difficult because I was running around with this. I couldn't focus for two minutes, right? My mind was always in the clouds, thinking of stuff, daydreaming. Yeah. Um, you know, very creative and active mind, but just not a focus. <laughs> and and the, the sort sure. of the class, you know, I did a lot of jokes and made people laugh and stuff like that. So the teachers told my mom, they're like, uh, you know, your son's not college. You know, they would get on me. He's not college material. I heard the um, same thing. They won't. Yeah. He won't. Mount, you know, mm. be prepared for having them do these types of jobs. Mm. And and my mom told me that. And you know, there's key people in your life that sort of don't let that that support you in not having that happen. Um, but my mom, you know, she's just an amazing lady. So if she wasn't my mom and anyone that knows her she was a school nurse for a lot of these schools in cheyenne oh okay. uh, everyone just she's uh just an angel on this they earth and her. she's helped yeah she helps a lot of people and just uh she couldn't tell a lie 
if she if she if tried, she, if she tried right? <laughs> and sometimes I'm like, Mom, don't say so much to the contractors. And, you know, to, to, I'm trying to coach her on some of that because yeah. I'm just like, everyone's, you know, just come in neutral. But, yeah, so that was, you know, I was set up to not make it. Um, yeah. And uh, in terms of schooling, yeah. And, again, when I got sent that challenge and they told me that, it's like, oh, yeah. You know, watch. I, and I just figured so out. I figured out ways to learn. Your mom. Your mom told you that to motivate you. Um, she. I don't remember how that got communicated to me. She didn't directly tell me it. Oh, okay. She has a way of just sort of. Um, uh, I'm making you grow without knowing a, a, a silent coach, and oh. I don't even think it was on purpose. Yeah. Right to pull a out the teacher. best. Yeah. And, yeah. And, great uh, teacher. Yeah. Yeah, and without you know, without her, you know. Yeah, you, they're important. The moms are. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a great testimony for moms. Yeah, yeah. you moms out there, uh, yeah, we we appreciate you very much. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, with your engineering, uh, math, and science interests, um, did that begin to show up uh, academically in high school, or did that just come later when you went to mines? Yeah, you know, it's, it's going to sound horrible, but I never liked math. <laughs> yeah. I, I did it. Me neither. I, yeah, I, I did it. That's way it, too left brain for yeah, me. Yeah. I, I like the parts of engineering I liked were, and this is where I, maybe a little disconnect, is I thought I'd be inventing and coming up with new ways to do stuff. And yeah. there's some there's engineering that involves that. Yes. But most engineering in industry, at least, is you have this little box that you get to make yeah. work right. Yeah. Right. And use all the math and science yeah. and physics to make that thing work right. Yeah. And so there wasn't enough creativeness in it. Uh, if I had it to do again, I I have a creative fl- I, I think I would have done, you know, marketing, more marketing or okay. or putting together campaign you know, campaigns or acting. I love acting. I, oh, da- I dabbled cool. in acting and yeah, always I loved it. <laughs> so yeah. but uh the thing I, you know, I never, never any regrets because everything I believe happens on purpose, for a purpose, when it's supposed to happen, is that engineering taught me process, yeah, right? Okay. And it actually probably helped with my ADHD. Okay. Right. Because you, you had to focus. You had to focus and you yeah. had to go through steps to finish a problem. And, yeah. and so it sort of forced you to sort of bring stuff. I'm just coming to that conclusion right now, but I'm sure it did yeah. help with some of that, right? Because you had a, I wasn't going to fail. And so I had to figure out ways to make that that work. Yeah, everything was a workaround. Yeah. That's what my son experienced, too. Yeah. You know, he had to find a way to get the grades he needed to get to get to where he wanted to be. Yeah. And he did. Yeah. Uh, but it was tough. Yeah. I mean, it was really, you know, a oh, real yeah. focus issue. Oh, it takes know? twice as long for, I mean, it yeah. takes, you know, just some people studying. just did it. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. uh yeah, and you know you're at you're in the school where they're not giving you breaks. No, you know no. there uh, there's no favors and all that. So I would you know, and I tended to do best in college um, during the seat when I was in sport, really? in track or football. That's interesting. Yeah, I think. Why do you think that is? Just no, ex- my all my time was structured. Oh, I right? see. I didn't really have mess around time. So yeah, yeah, it had to be very structured, and. Uh, yeah, it sort of pulled that all in. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. You know, that's a good argument for the, the value of sports. Yeah. I think. You know, it yeah. tends to focus men and, and women. You know, and yep. that's a good thing. Um, let's talk about project management and the oil fields. And <laughs> you have a very impressive resume. Yeah. So uh, you were in charge of one one thing I read was like 36 square miles or something like that in, yeah. in California oil fields. Yeah. How'd that happen? So that was for um, Chevron yeah. um, when I was a project management at, uh, manager at Chevron. Yeah, so project management happened um, starting at Hewlett Packard. Okay. Right. And then I took some time off um, after Hewlett Packard. There was a big old change where Hewlett Packard was acquiring. Co- I won't bore everyone with it, but there was a, 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 a culture change mm-hmm. that I didn't necessarily like. It was feeling pretty unhealthy. Yeah. So I said, you know what, this is a time to take a break. Okay. And that's my first time I tried to do my own business. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. So I moved out to California and I started a wellness business. 
I did very well at it. Uh, Good. Training small. You were corporate. coaching. Uh, I was a trainer. Okay. And a life coach type of wellness okay. type of thing, and working yeah. with executives and small businesses. And uh, yeah, and so you that, liked it. I loved it. Yeah. I loved it, but I wasn't growing a team. So so now in my business coaching, I teach on how to grow your brand and your team and and do all that. But at the time, I was a one man. Yeah, one man, man show, band, yeah, right, yeah. and and that gets exhausting to some level. So I was like, you know what, I'll close this. I don't want my gap to get too big between my project management experience. So I, at that time, I um, stopped. I, I stopped working on that business and went into uh, back into project management. Oh, uh, okay. And uh, worked for a company called Era, A E R A, which was the number one producer in California. Oil. Oil. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I started putting in big facilities, you know, yeah. uh, anywhere from five, 5 million things. refineries, water wow. processing plants, wow. Yeah, wow. stuff like that. And did, what did you like about that? That's highly complex. Uh, and <laughs> not, every, yeah, not everybody <laughs> thrives in that environment. You know. But there was always drama. There's always drama when you're dealing with all those moving parts, right? Oh, yeah. And yeah. so I always say a good project manager just needs, you need to be an influencer because it's mostly managing yeah. peop, people problems, yeah. right? And so the part, I love that part yeah. because I typically get along with people and would pull out the best in them. Yes. Right? And then we're, all in, the, we're all in this together and, yeah. and we would all, yeah, it's very make it, interesting. Make it work. Yeah, you're <laughs> you know? right. It's very interesting yeah. because I was a sales trainer for quite a while. Yeah. And influence skills are like number one. Oh, yeah. You know, when you are working with people that you have no direct authority over, mm -hmm. you know, and you're trying to get them to do something for you, <laughs> yeah. right, that's not really going to benefit them, you really have to pull out all the stops yeah that's it and convince them that this is going to help them in some fashion yeah and the company and us and yeah, yeah, yeah all of yeah. us together yeah. yeah so you've taught some of that mm -hmm. and, and and what kind of groups are you talking to when you're explaining team building uh usually uh corporate teams oh okay like and i'm about ready to start uh, i'm putting on a program to start talking to project managers oh okay right okay. uh to bring some of those skills and all that so uh, that's what that's sort of a space I want to move into. Okay. Um, and then I just talk with kids, you know, and colleges yeah. and uh, e at events and stuff like that because everything's a project. Sure. Right. When you think about it, everything you do oh, yeah. is a project, and it should be approached to some level like and that. You start so today, and you got to get got to get to be with then, the product. Yeah. yeah. How are you going to make yeah. that all happen? Yeah. And, and the systems in place to make it. And, you know, so it works by itself, so you don't have to, when you want to scale, it's not breaking. Yeah. You know, so you just have to think things through a little bit. And so, yeah, everything's a project. Yeah. And and reproducible. Reproducible. You know, yep. You know, it, it, a trainer, I think, really uh, is most needed uh, when they come into a situation where there are multiple teams and they can't work together. Mm -hmm. They're in silos, as mm -hmm. we say. Right, we'll and, talk and about that, that. The silos thing is a crazy one, right? Because yeah. you got to pull people because they're protecting their. Oh yeah, so their, their, their silo. silo. Yeah, that's and, right. And You're so, not busting into no, my silo, especially <laughs> when I did the government work. I mean, the silos were. Oh, thick. we want to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, we're going to take another brief break and come back with Jackson Crisp for our final segment, and uh, we want you to stick around because it's going to be nothing but fun. We'll be right back. Our world isn't perfect. Just watch the news. Evil is everywhere. Now, the core of who we are, we all know and feel these things to be wrong. But why? Why do we agree that some actions are wrong? Where did we get our standard, the moral code that tells us good from bad? If we're creating it ourselves, free to choose what works for us, then that would make every action acceptable. Good and bad would be the same, then people who commit heinous crimes wouldn't be guilty. They'd simply be doing what's right for them. And yet we say they're guilty. When someone murders an innocent person, it bothers us, enrages us. We hate injustice. Now, maybe we're in a game of 
survival of the fittest. Suffering and death simply weed out those who aren't strong enough or lucky enough to have won the genetic lottery. But if that's true, why do stories of death and destruction draw up feelings of deep disgust and hurt inside you? Why does your heart break at the news of tragedy? And why do so many other people feel the same way? Could it be that there's something more? Some greater outside force that has ingrained you with the desire for love and goodness? Suppose there's a reason behind hating the evil in the world. Suppose it leads to something greater. Could it lead to hope? And welcome back to Las Vegas Tonight. I'm your host, Dale Davidson. If you watched the last two segments, and I hope you did, uh, you've really learned a lot about Jackson Crisp and uh, his wide, varied experiences. And uh, he's really a good guy. Um, <laughs> Let's talk about foundation work. That's a little bit different, the nonprofit yeah. world. Yeah. How did you get involved in foundations? So that's that's a crazy story. So yeah. uh, no one really knew about my football background. Besides looking at my size, I'd always get the assumption that I played football. But I never really talked about my experiences. Yeah. And uh, I got here to Vegas, and someone invited me to an NFL alumni event okay i was like oh they have nfl alumni events <laughs> you know what is that yeah so i end up going to this thing and uh, that's where i met marlon okay right and uh we just hit it off i was yeah. like oh my marlon god my, my brothers have yeah. come home right yeah. like in terms of just because there's guy. a yeah he, he's an amazing guy and just the guys there it was like instantly you never it's like a, a brotherhood forever oh yeah sure right and you have the different personalities and all the crazy and the <laughs> cocky and all that but it's a brotherhood <laughs> yeah you know and uh so i was just like oh this is amazing and uh, so i got more involved and start helping Marlon out. Um, at the time, it was Lyndon King. Uh, he's a Raiders alumni. Oh, okay. Uh, I was helping them out. I became a member, and they yeah. asked me to be on the board of directors right away. And so I kept helping them out. Right. And um, another friend of mine through my speaking channels, so I'm on the board of directors for the NFL Alumni Vegas. Right. And another friend of mine through the speaking channels was just starting a foundation, or not just starting it, but growing it in the United States. Right. So she was doing work overseas. Okay. Um, con called Unsilenced Voices, and she talked to me about helping her grow the on this side, state side. Okay. And sort of growing the whole program and helping her with that. And um, it's called Unsilenced Voices. What's that about? And it's uh, they fight human trafficking and domestic abuse. Okay worldwide okay right and so pretty dark subject and with covid was happening all those numbers just took off yeah and people didn't realize that everyone's yeah. at home and the people that were trapped were more trapped and and all that so i said absolutely i will come on board and help, and help. yeah and so i started off again as quickly as an advisor and then right into board of directors on unsilenced voices okay and what i always challenge people to do is if you have the means or the influence, use it for good, yes. right, where you can. And and uh, not expected, but the world needs it. Boy, and, don't and, we. and typically most the people pour into it. that. Yeah. And so the guy, the football guys just all have huge hearts. You know, yeah. the retired guys, um, a lot, some of them are very broken and, you know, some head injuries and, and stuff like that, always a huge heart. Yeah. And so, I've always been a protective guy as a tackle. Yeah, it, it also translates into life, right? Yeah. And uh, so I was like, well, let's take the alumni and amplify unsilenced voices. Okay. So I asked some of the guys on the uh, NFL alumni side if they would come in and pour into our first fundraiser. Wow. Right. And, that's then, great. and then we got some high level speakers to come to it. And it was an amazing show up to this little, her first fundraiser. And I think we ended up raising in a day uh, over $100,000 or oh, something, wow. right, to launch this That's thing. That's huge. Yeah, and then Michelle's just been kicking butt since. Um, wow. And, uh, we've What's been, your last name? We've been Michelle Jewsbury. Oh, okay. With Unsilenced Voices. So okay. Unsilenced 
with a D, unsilencedvoices.org. Okay. If you guys want to go pour in, it's an amazing initiative. Yeah. Um, just recently, I did um, I did step down uh, because we actually grew massively. Um, so I'm now an advisor okay. for them still. Okay. Um, but uh, they are they're growing and, and bringing people on board. Uh, so hopefully it'll be a million dollar foundation, oh, you know, after this year. That's great. And all, all within a couple of years. Yeah, that's great. So yeah, she she and the team and you know are just kicking butt. Yeah, are, have you thought about starting your own the way Marlon Greenwood has? Eventually, yes. Yeah. Okay. And so that's the other one. You know, I also pour into Marlon's foundation. Yeah, so I know you do. Yeah. He does those free camps and all that, and we utilize the NFL alumni Life for kids. Yeah. For Shield, yeah, for the kids, the yeah. kids camps, and uh, that's mg fifty two dot org. Um, so free camps. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and he's working on the projects that you guys talked about. So I'm pouring in with that, helping him wherever I can with that. Right. And the alumni helps where they can with that in terms of some cross branding and all that, and helping that initiative. So, wow. Yeah, well, they're lucky. Stuff they're happening. lucky to have you. You're a yeah. smart guy and hardworking <laughs> guy. Yeah. Well, that's oh, so that and this, that's what happened with the NFL alumni Vegas chapter is um, we were doing stuff. Right. And uh, the guys sort of like the speaking presence and all that, so they decided mm -hmm. to vote me in to uh, – Lyndon stepped down, retired oh, as okay. president. So Marlon and got voted into president, and then I got voted into vice president. Congratulations. So, so this guy that had a sort of a rapid ending, you know, <laughs> picks back up at the, at the – you know, this stage in life again as a, you know, a contributing officer there. So that's pretty cool. Well, that's – not how you start, it's how you finish. Yeah, right. Isn't that what they say? <laughs> yeah. And that really is so, true. Yeah. It really it's is true. Definitely an honor. Let's talk about the future. Uh, where do you, you've got so many things going on, which is great. Uh, where do you want to go? Where do you want to be? So, yeah, I want to step into, um, like I said, more speaking, inspirational, and motivational speaking. Right. Um, I want to write, <laughs> I need to finish. I've been a contributing author. And right. I'm up to some books, yeah. But I want to get my own story on autobiography. Uh, get it down, yeah. yeah. In yeah. terms of uh, yeah. some work there, and then I have this. Um, uh, I want to keep pouring into these foundations, right? right and raising the vibration there, uh, however I can. And then, um, so that keeps me busy. And then I'm also working on. So I'm an inventor. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you more about that. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about your inventions, the one you, ones you can talk about. Because I know you have some, yeah. <laughs> some in, in, you don't want to give away everything. Well, I also yeah. don't want to bore, <laughs> bore the hell out of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> because there's this processes and all that that get a little nutty. But uh, no, I've been an invent, that's just, that's just me. I'm, I'm always, I just see things. And, and you know when they say a flash, a light bulb flash? Oh, yeah, yeah. I literally... When I when something comes to me, it's a really it's a, a like flash, a startled thing. like a yeah, you like see it. boom, yeah, like yeah. a like a like a flash, and so I've just always um, I'm I used to not been so good at it lately because I'm too busy, but I used to just write down just thousands of ideas one after the other, one after another, yeah. multiples a day, yeah, right, and then every once in a while one would be a winner, and I would put it through and write up specifications to start working. So I actually. My my patent attorney, I've been working with him for probably ten years, and so he's gotten you some patents, right? Yeah, he's got. We've gotten some patents, so I, I'll, I'll work on the spec to try to keep costs down because they're not ex they're expensive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He, he's not cheap. Yeah, no, but uh, so I'll work on specifications and and then he'll work up the specifications and the claims. Oh, I see. And okay. so there was one I just recently received. I've started it back in two thousand ten. Takes a while, doesn't it? Well, it, no, it doesn't take that long. But what I was doing was just kicking the can down the road. I just kept filing a application after, oh, to okay. keep that string alive. Oh, okay. And then uh, two years ago, when right before COVID hit, I said, you know what? I'll go ahead and apply for a. I'll, I'll actually prosecute it and try to get a patent. And uh, we did. And so that was pretty exciting. And Congratulations. It's, uh, yeah. And so it was a pretty big one. I'm now running against some time. You know, the, the the thing with patents is there's these timelines. That once you start it, you have to you're do constantly you're on a race to just keep stuff um, uh, current. Okay. And so I'm doing a lot of that now. So um, you asked me what I'm doing. So speaking, 
uh, pouring into those foundations a book and then um, developing this. I'm developing an application and I'm actually developing a pitch deck to find investors right now. Wow, okay. Um, so if, okay. That, if that takes off and I get a, a, a serious investor, that'll take a lot of my time. Um, oh, okay. To bring that. Because you'll have to. Yeah. To bring it to market. To bring it to market yeah. and do all the work. So we're going to see you on Shark Tank? <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually, I was actually up for Shark Tank. Were you really? On a previous invention. Really? Uh, yeah. I actually have the infomercial. I can <laughs> I can send it to you sometime. It's horrible. <laughs> Ho- horribly embarrassing. <laughs> but... Um, no, I'm actually, I just, I have a lot of friends. So through these networks, right? Yeah, sure, um, sure. Um, they're just mentoring me and getting me set up with a lot. You of know, them. let's talk about networking for a minute. Uh, give people out there, kids especially, yeah. a feeling for how important that is. Oh, man. You know, you talked about mentors, several mentors in your life. Mm. That's that's crucial, isn't it? It's, it's beyond crucial. And there's actually, uh, yeah, integrity and then this aligning with heart-centered like people you're not going to necessarily get along with all aspects of everyone but you want to focus on the parts that you do get along with yeah and the folks that can help you with what you're trying to do and and um yeah don't burn bridges even if you disagree with someone i just it's not ever you know go go hit a punching leave and go lift weights or 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 do something else (laughs) because you just don't know how that's going to affect you later on yeah um we've all done that uh, especially earlier on in our life where we just before we learn before we learn yeah yeah so just practice patience and it's not gonna you know doing that stuff just like with violence and anger and all that's not ever going to help anything you know ever ever yeah and so just learn those triggers and to bring yourself down and and to walk away, and then typically you're always very glad you didn't. Yeah. You didn't do something ridiculous. Um, and sometimes treat, you treat sometimes you say, "I wish I would have said that." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's about it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, you know the, the biblical phrase is "Do unto others as you would have them do unto you." You know. Yeah. And that's very helpful. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, we've only got about three, maybe four minutes left in the show, and I'm going to ask you a favor, prevail upon you. Uh, I know you're a man of faith, and and you walk around with uh, with Jesus in your heart. Um, that's your camera. Would you mind addressing the camera and talk talk to people, especially young people today, okay. on uh, how having faith, no matter really what kind of faith it is, okay. uh, and how that helps you in your life. Yeah. So, um, especially now, the world is hurting. We all know it. Sometimes we skate it and don't want to address it. Um, we project stuff, but ultimately we see a lot of just uh, not so good stuff happening. And the one thing I always challenge, I don't get into politics typically on my, you know, when I'm speaking and all that, but we all know values. And uh, just as hard as I believe exercise helps with our um, emotional mastery and how we handle stuff and being a better person. Uh, Mentally, it does. I also believe you got to exercise yourself spiritually as hard. And uh, I think that that's where a lot of stuff is lacking. So I would just challenge all the young folks out there and, uh, and everybody to start exercising that spiritual part of yourself. Um, It's super, super important. And um, and then being to- not just tolerant, accepting of other people. If they're not hurting people, and their faith, whatever that may be, is helping them and helping the world, you want to support that. And so that's sort of uh, that's sort of how I live, and I I feel like I live sort of uh, sim- like in, uh, symbiotically with the higher with the higher power and divinity, Jesus, God. Um, universal power, whatever your definition is, and uh, when you're living in that, you won't do you won't do wrong, and this are on the side of treating people good. That's great. So thank you, Jackson. Yeah. I think you really help some people. Yeah, and uh, and I can tell just you know with the bigness of your heart that mm-hmm. that's what you live, mm-hmm. and uh, you're gonna you've been successful, and 
and I think you're gonna we're gonna see even more <laughs> I as hope time so. goes by. Yeah. You know, so please keep us in mind, and especially when you get your book done, come back. Okay, that's and how to read. let's promote the book. Okay, you know, get the whole autobiography going on, and all right, but then you'll be world famous. <laughs> <laughs> do you mind if I tell them how to? Get oh no, please do. Okay. please do. So, um, if any of, if any of this stuff resonated with you, with the foundations, Marlins Foundation, MG uh, MG fifty two dot org, Unsilenced Voices, the Human Trafficking Domestic Violence Initiative, uh, Unsilenced with a D dot uh, org. Um, or the NFL alumni uh, org. Make sure to, you can reach me directly or if you want to work with me or get in communication with me to uh, pour in and help as a coach, a speaker, whatever that may be, you can always reach me at uh, www.jackson.coach. It's very easy. I made it pretty easy for everyone yeah. to remember. Jackson.coach. And uh, with any uh, thing uh, involving any of those, and I can help you out. I didn't even know there was a domain. Right, what a great, idea. <laughs> what a great <laughs> idea. It works. You know? Jackson dot coach. Because Chris, when I do Jackson Chris, they're like Chris. You know, I get misspellings <laughs> all over the place. It's like you know, you know, Chris the P. Oh, that's funny. That's <laughs> yeah. funny. God bless you. Thanks for coming yeah, on the thank show. Thanks for having me, brother. Jackson Chris, ladies and gentlemen, terrific guest, <laughs> and a, and a wonderful human being. So please help him out and get in touch with him. And uh, boy, he was a great guest. And I want to thank you all for watching. Uh, we so appreciate your support of Las Vegas tonight. Feel free to, uh, to go to my website, uh, which is vegassaints.org. And as I try to recall uh, each and every week to say when it comes to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, please walk with him. God bless you. What is the Bible? What does it say? Why do people care about it? And what does it have to do with you?
Christians claim the Bible was authored by God through human hands to share his story and help us understand who he is. It's a diverse collection of literature, including historical accounts, poetry, stories, and wisdom. It contains mind-blowing adventures like men being thrown into a fire-filled furnace. Yet they weren't burned. It speaks of an old man who was lowered into a lion's den, only to be supernaturally protected and not eaten. It also tells the story of a little girl who had died, yet miraculously came back to life. The Bible is one book that contains 66 smaller books. It was written over a period of 1,500 years and authored by over 40 different people that range from shepherds to doctors, scholars, farmers, and kings. Completed 2,000 years ago, historians say it's one of the most reliable books on the planet. Over 10,000 manuscripts have survived the centuries. Compare that to only 235 known manuscripts of Shakespeare's first folio. Mm -hmm. There have been over 5 billion copies printed worldwide, making it the most reproduced book in the world. The Bible is divided into two sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is well known for its early history of the world and insight into life, giving wisdom such as don't murder and love one another. Other sections are a bit racy, such as your breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. The first four books in the New Testament tell the story of Jesus through the perspectives of four of his closest friends. The rest of the New Testament is stories and letters revealing what Jesus' closest followers did after his time on earth. God used average people to heal all kinds of diseases and drive out demons. Many of Jesus' followers were killed because they dared to preach his message. Jesus claimed to be the human manifestation of God's unfailing love for humanity and the secret for true inner peace. He gave hope to the hopeless, love to the unloved, and then gave his life to bring never-ending life to everyone who would believe in him. That's where you come in. Beware, reading this book will change you. As you read it, its message of hope will come alive in you. That's what it's designed to do. Why not give it a shot and see for yourself what it says? It just might surprise you. Morning shine, shine, shine. Las Vegas shine your light on me. You've been watching Las Vegas Tonight with your host, Dale Davidson. We hope you've enjoyed this edition of our show. We so appreciate your loyalty to our program. To keep Las Vegas Tonight on the air, please go to our website, VegasSaints.org, and click the donate button. To send a check or money order, Please make it out to Dale Wynn Davidson Ministries and mail it to 9030 West Sahara Avenue, Suite 255, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89117. To suggest a guest to appear on the show or any other suggestions or questions, write to Dale at DaleWDavidson at Yahoo.com or call him at 702 480 3989.